Um, good afternoon. My name is Murli Daran. I am the chair for Fiki Telangana. It's a very exciting day for us in uh, Fiki Telangana because we're talking about something which is really transformational for the country. All of us know education is one of the foundations of any country. And in India, it's more so because bulk of the Indian families, one of the largest item on their expenditure budget is children's education. Many, children, many families and their parents sacrifice their entire savings and money to educate their children. The new education policy has built a lot of hopes. We had a very large session a few uh, weeks ago where we invited national speakers and international speaker to look at the national education policy. The general consensus at that time was the policy is aspirational. It has a lot of positives in it. Probably for the first time, we put the spotlight on the reality on the ground. So the policy acknowledges some of the limitations and challenges of the Indian education system. But the consensus of that meeting was that we should focus on the implementation. As it happens in government policies, policies are always outstanding, created with a lot of good intention. But if the implementation is not successful, then all the effort and all the hope that we build will not be there. So then we agreed that we will hold a session, uh, a very important session on the implementation of NEP. So from the morning, we have had two sessions. One is an opening session and followed by breakout sessions. So today, in this session, it's important to focus on bringing in these recommendations that Fiki and the team and the speakers have brought together and present it in front of some of the policy makers, uh, policy implementers, in this case, some of the key people at the bureaucracy and at the administration of education in Telangana. So today I am very, very excited to invite all of you for this closing session or concluding session. Um, primarily, we are having four presentations so five minutes each on the first session and the three breakout session each. So we are inviting one person from each of those four sessions to speak for five minutes and I request them to stick to five minutes and they are supposed to present only top five. We don't want too many items. The problem in India, we talk about too many things. We ask them to prioritize and present top five action items. So we will have five action items from each of them. So there have been 20 action items. Then we follow with Professor Raman Rao, who will be presenting as an IIT director. He'll be presenting on his research on the higher education, what we can do in Telangana. Then we have Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, who is the president of FIKI. She has taken time out from a very busy schedule to be present here for this session on Telangana, how to make Telangana the outstanding destination for education in India. Thereafter, we have uh, invited some of the IS officers who are involved. Primarily, we have uh, Naveen Mittal and morning, I think we got a good accolade about him, about his uh, positive orientation. And we also have Jayesh Ranjan who will be speaking, followed by that. I don't know if Chitra Ram, Chitra, um, is already there. Uh, she is there. She will join us at that point of time. Otherwise, Chitra Ram, uh, Ramchandran is not there. We'll go ahead with the concluding session. So this is the broad framework. I'm going to now invite our first session summary uh, from Ashwini. Okay, over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Mr. Molidharan. And if my slides can go up, because I have a format which has been given by Zakir. So we had a great session this morning uh, with lessons from top ranked institutions, one in the top 100 of the world from the UK University of Southampton and Qatar University in the top 250 in the world uh, from a rather young institution there from Qatar University. Uh, and we put in what QS uh, has been thinking and has got uh, from around the Middle East, North Africa and South Asian region. We put some things together and the lessons, what we have five points for Telangana. Uh, which I think are important. I've summarized this. The first is that we need to see increased government investment in higher education for capacity building of institutions in the state without any differentiation of public, private, uh, deemed, or whatever other differentiations are there. There needs to be more investment in the sector. 
the second is there needs to be a strategy perhaps at a state level to encourage cutting edge and globally relevant research from institutions in the state which will attract global collaboration because that has been seen as one of the single most effective element in the two case studies we have seen today followed by promoting agile leadership now i know that we have a lot of systems in india uh, with uh, different types of institutions but i think if you can promote agile leaderships within institutions giving more power with accountability of of course to leaders to make decisions which will help them attract international faculty uh, get equipment get so many other things with the investment that is provided that will also help telangana uh, fourth is produce globally accepted and renowned graduates which are work ready with curriculum that is planned keeping in mind industry needs and future requirements and uh, finally the fourth one is promoting uh, and branding of telangana as a global higher education hub now we can look at case studies uh, of uh, of states uh, we see study queensland uh, new south wales in australia uh, or uh, wellington in uh, new zealand or we can see uk study in uk the promotion all of these all of these promotions happen by promoting uh, the 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 entity and i think in this case telangana and uh, somehow promoting excellence in this project by using competition uh, that is rankings ratings other competitive mechanisms which will help institutions do better uh, and compete and be able to uh, to go out there to the world to uh, to prove that telangana is ready to receive international students telangana is ready for global collaborations telangana is ready for global business so as uh, what was done with uh, it uh, of becoming the silicon valley of india i think that's the drive what we need to see for telangana to become a global higher education hub it is not impossible it was done for it for technology i mean i started my career my first job was out of hyderabad uh, you know at uh, when i started as an internship at hsbc so the world has already come to, to come to telangana for technology and and for other services why not for higher education that can happen with the government in investment and uh, putting the right infrastructure in place uh, in in this so i think the fifth point is not shown on the screen uh, but uh, that's the branding of telangana these are the five points which we have for uh, for you all, all to take back and contemplate on. So thank you so much. Quinn, and yeah, Quinn, I have a question. You have one more minute to answer that question. Sure. See the challenge for all of us. There is not much money because we are going through a COVID scenario. India is going to a revival phase, and the government is already prioritizing a lot of poverty alleviation programs. I think both at the center and the state. So can I rephrase this? How do we increase investment? Because private investments can drive education significantly. You know that. Large yes. universities in the world have also large locations have gone by private investment. So branding of Telangana and definitely promoting investment, whether it is government or private, is not important. In my okay. mind, that could be my question is how do we promote private investment? That's the key. Uh, indeed, I think uh, one of one of the areas where we've seen uh, globally, uh, and I think it's also pointed out by Professor Sabu and as well as uh, as Caesar is uh, having the CSR uh, activities where uh, companies are willing to contribute, take up units within the university, take up labs, uh, fund activities. I think that has to be <coughs> promoted in the DNA of the state, uh, where the state has, you know, you provide 1% to universities and so on. So thank you. Thank that's you. Exciting, that's very wonderful. I like the branding piece. I'm sure we will discuss it later on. Uh, thank you so sure. much. Now pleasure, I have Shantanu Paul. I request Shantanu Paul to uh, come in and present. Hi Shantanu. Hi Mohit. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. We can. Wonderful. Yeah, good looking. You're looking good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try to present uh, my uh, slide. Yeah. Five minutes, Shantanu, and uh, some yeah. time for one question at least from me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just give me one second to uh, pull this up. Okay, you should be able to see a screen now. Yes, yes, it's coming up. Yeah, some flickering, but uh, it's yeah. flickering a bit. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So it's the same thing. Give me one second. Yeah. 
stop and start again. Yeah. Let's hope it works now. Let's see. Give us a second. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You can see it's Murli? Good. Yeah, okay. it's very good. Very good. Go ahead. Should I get going? Okay. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Murli. Um, and then thanks once again to the organizers and Fikit for arranging for this. We just had a very vigorous session um, for the last one hour with my colleagues who were uh, Kala uh, Anand from uh, Kriya University. We are Shari Pratap Singh from uh, Coursera. And we are Supreet Nagaraju from Adobe head of education. So pretty good mix of people. And we had a pretty a wide range debate on many things. And I've kind of tried to distill down the key points because it's something that's sharp and executable at some level. So the idea of blended learning, I think the basic understanding is that uh, the new normal is blended learning. Even after in a post COVID world, nobody expects to go back to the old normal. And uh, what is going to happen is going to be some judicious mix of learning uh, through physical and digital means. And that mix will vary based on context and situation and programs and various other factors, as well as changing conditions in, in the overall public health landscape, perhaps, uh, depending on all that. So blended learning is here to stay with its 80, 20, 90, 10, 10, 20. All that will be a function of uh, way forward. In a very crude analogy, I'd like to uh, make this a little lighthearted to say that you know we've all learned to live in this country with power and a generator. right? Sometimes you don't use a generator for months, and sometimes you do it for 10 days in a row. And in some sense, the physical campus and digital campus are exactly that. The twins now going forward that are joined at the hip. Your physical campus is running beautifully. You kind of don't need the digital campus. Suddenly something disrupts in the physical world. You have to switch to your digital campus. And that kind of has to take over and seamlessly continue the process of education. So that is the worldview that we all have developed. So with that being the case, there are five uh, specific things that I wanted to share. One was that um, you know clearly the student learning centric uh, learner centric world is here and the whole new education policy talks about putting the learner at the center of the universe so in that sense uh, the first and foremost requirement is to create a seamless and frictionless learning capability in terms of technology infrastructure for students so the idea of broadband access and computing gear whether that's in the form of a desktop or a laptop or a tablet i think it's now becoming clear that you know uh, for a few hundred years school systems have had books and uniforms, I think, and school buses, this is the new equivalent of that in a digital campus. We need that fundamental dial tone, so to speak, so that every student can access the education digitally without having to worry about connectivity issues and access issues from a technical perspective. So that's the first thing, creating a homogeneous rollout of uh, broadband and computing gear for students. The second point is the problem of institutions. Uh, institutions are not necessarily equipped. They don't have Typically, you know, the top schools may be able to have a CTO or a chief digital officer. It's not conceivable that they'll be able to have the same kind of leadership of technology at every college and every university. So we're going to have a problem of saying that what is the technology infrastructure and readiness of each of the institutions? So I'll give you a simple example from the banking world. Um, you know, many years ago, uh, our Indian banking system went through a big transformation called core banking. You know, they implemented CBS, core banking system, and, and that led to a huge amount of efficiency and productivity increase. In the banking system but the big public sector banks and private sector banks could afford their own technology and stack and their own organizations to support core banking however the, co the cooperative banks had a different problem they couldn't afford that kind of leadership and technology investment so they all ganged up together into a consortium and set up through rbi's help an institution called iftas iftas which basically put on the cloud a core banking system that could be used and shared by all the smaller banks cooperative banks so that became Therefore, the default go-to infrastructure for running core banking if you're a cooperative bank. So the same analogy if you apply here, how to run live classrooms, how to like run asynchronous learning pre and post lectures, how to run virtual labs, all this, every institution cannot possibly figure this out by themselves. So they have to basically rely upon a common backend. So we are recommending a scalable cloud-based learning delivery platform or learning management system that can be shared by institutions. So that would be, at the state level, could be a very nice asset to build. Shantanu, you have one minute. Until sure. one minute. Yeah. The third piece is about large scale teacher training. I think there's a clear consensus that transforming students is not a problem. They are digitally uh, native. Transforming faculty and professors will be a big challenge, is a big challenge, because there is a tendency to hark back and say that classrooms are better, physical classrooms. So a technology problem and a psychology problem we have to overcome in terms of large scale teacher training, a faculty training. The fourth and fifth points, in some sense, are relatively easy to talk about because Telangana has already taken a lead in these areas where providing supplemental digital content through Coursera on campus kind of solutions has been made available. So 
academic enrichment for students can happen. And so can be offered through the same enrichment model, deep tech programs for high value employment. All the new technologies coming through can be made available through either minors or 20 credits of special additional learning, all of which Telangana is a leader in, in terms of providing already. So I would say one, two, three are clear, actionable stuff, four and five already underway. That's the status. And, and thank you for that opportunity. Thank Back you, Shan. I think I'll conclude by only one comment, uh, which I think what you are talking about to make the div the digital divide should not should not be there at the bottom of the pyramid. So we need to create a common infrastructure which gives the same opportunity to a poor kid to access the network as a rich kid, and they get the same benefits. I see that point is a very valid point. Maybe we need Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi for data transfer costs are high. And we also need pad based uh, learning models so that they don't depend on a local processing, but want more of network based processing or cloud based processing. I think the point is very valid. I thank you for that. And now I invite uh, Atul Kosla, Professor Atul Kosla, to, uh, to quickly share his five comments or five top recommendations from his group. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Atul. I believe you're not well. Uh, I believe you are not well. We appreciate you finding time and coming here, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So I actually am just recovering from COVID. Today is my first serious day of work, and I have to tell you that I really enjoyed the discussions, and uh, my energy is back. So education is in the blood, I guess. So uh, we spoke about uh, uh, sustainability. How do we make institutions more sustainable? And we had a wonderful panel. Uh, Professor Raman Ramanathan, uh, Amrita Sadarangani of uh, University of Edinburgh, and Professor P. J. Narayanan. Let me try to pull up uh, a small presentation if that works. Otherwise, I'll just speak about it. One second, Murli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, is this working? Not yet. We're still waiting. I think the backend is working. Or yeah, I think it's beginning. Yes, you're on. Put it on display mode. Now, how do I go into display mode in the PPT? Yeah, probably I need to put it in the. Yeah, give me one second. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go with it. Anyway, it's uh, okay. a small screen. Uh, go. Yeah, I think it isn't better. Better. Yeah. Right. So uh, there are, there were five key areas we spoke about. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Ranan spoke about support support that uh, uh, Telangana can give to new institutions, very similar to ISB and IIIT. So I have to give you one anecdote. I remember when uh, the ISB was being formed and I used to be at McKinsey and Company, you know, we were always looking at uh, Maharashtra as a place where ISB would be founded. But somewhere, uh, I think uh, the support we got from at that point of time, the state of Andhra Pradesh, uh, you know, made sure that ISB was founded in Hyderabad. And I think that's the type of support that it's not just about the triple IITs or the IITs, but even private universities, and some of them are doing a great job. They need to get the same type of regulatory and infra support. So I think that's point number one. Uh, the second point is, uh, as from a sustainability perspective, uh, institutions need to become self-sustaining. So they need to have uh, incubators in every college, every university. So clearly some support coming from the Atal Innovation Mission here, but I think proactively the state can go out and make sure that there's a startup in every university and college. I understand there's already a T-Hub initiative, which is already on. The third is uh, ensuring and facilitating private sector funding in research. Uh, no university can become a great university without great research and innovation funding. And as we understand, it cannot just be uh, reliant on government, but also the private sector. So again, uh, can the state facilitate private sector funding into research, especially if it's happening in some of the new universities? Fourth is the issue of, which I think was a great idea that came about, was building clusters of universities or collaborations inside the state itself. While there are lots and lots of talk about partnerships and funding happening outside uh, between Indian universities and global universities, there could be a case for creating clusters of expertise inside the state. For example, an AI cluster could be there. There could be a biotechnology cluster of universities, etc. And finally, 
Uh, can the state provide support for foreign partnerships which are deeper in nature, especially in the context of the new education policy inviting new campuses? So can we brand Telangana and can we get a couple of uh, top 50, top 20 campuses into the state? So these are broadly five areas that we spoke about and hopefully the government will implement. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, Natu. I think whenever we talk about private universities, whenever we talk about foreign universities, the biggest concern is the cost of education and the affordability of education for many of the Indian children. And I think has your team, for example, have you thought about you've been running a university yourself? And therefore, my question is, how do we blend digital learning and, and classroom learning to bring down the cost to make it affordable for many kids to attend. For example, you can increase the capacity in the existing universities to more kids come in two days a week, and therefore you can make out the cost of education lower. Have you ever thought about it? Any thoughts on how to lower the cost of education and in the context of sustainability? Absolutely, I think uh, uh, you've hit the nail on the head, Murli. Uh, so first of all, uh, the type of numbers we look at in terms of uh, uh, capital expenditure needed to start a university. I think those will fundamentally change with new technologies coming in. So we don't need, we have to start thinking uh, asset light rather than asset heavy. So I think that's the first thing, very, very important thing that needs to happen. But more importantly, I think on research, I'd like to make a point over here. Historically, when we look at research and innovation, that was all done inside the institution. And I think that's really the big change that's happening where the value chain is splicing. I'll give a small example over here. If I have to do a small experiment where I have to understand the molecular characterization, for example, of amla or haldi, I don't have those uh, uh, big equipments out there, but I can actually send the uh, ge uh, genetic material over to, let's say, Stanford. They can do the experiment, I can do the analysis, and everyone can be happy in the process. So uh, I think the whole university model is going to change. Well, on the education side, you'll see much more online coming in. Uh, quality of education has dramatically gone up with technology, in my opinion. Uh, yes, there are some hiccups, and I heard about them uh, just prior to this, but I think in the next six months, all the hiccups. The more importantly, the biggest cost of a university is research. And I think that's really where uh, there'll be new models coming in and uh, great research will start happening, new innovation will start happening uh, through, through technology. So uh, personally speaking, I'm very gungo about it. Our panel was very gungo about, you know, how uh, post COVID, uh, what, earlier what you needed with, uh, let's say 100, you can do with 10. So that's really what's going to happen. I, I can't hear you. I think there's some problem with my, uh, unless. No, it's okay. Can, yeah, I can hear you. Heard you. Yeah, we've heard you. Uh, I'm now going to, is my audio coming clearly? I'm Absolutely. inviting the last group, Mr. Nathan, and uh, his group to come and present. I think the most important piece of this session is going to be on student experience. I think uh, many of us in India are worried about this because in the cost, in the context of increasing technology, increasing the kind of uh, exposure, students are lost. They are the main stakeholder in this. So I will invite the next group to present for five minutes, the top five recommendations from student experience. Yeah, thank you. Who's presenting this, Nathan group? Nathan, are you there? All right. So, Dakar, I think um, uh, anybody from the other side who's speaking from this group, um, then I, I think I should go ahead with the reading of whatever their recommendations are because I'm not able to see anybody from that group. Uh, D-Link affiliation. I think make, make it without the uh, painful bureaucracy. I think that's something everybody's talking about. I think the new delegation policy also talking about affiliated colleges and non-affiliated colleges. Uh, the second one is on migration. Just a minute. Yes, Sudhakar, I'm on the, on, the, on the live. What happened? Tell me to read. I'm reading anyway. Migration of students from colleges. Uh, make it seamless. I think it's also very clearly coming out uh, as part of the uh, recommendations of the NEP that there should be a clear cut opportunity for students to migrate. And that also is an important step. Uh, policy is excellent, uh, but implementation must be the focus. I think all of us are on top of that. 
bring in the top campus from uh, the world to Telangana. Yes, we talked about it earlier. The biggest challenge is going to be, can we afford them? Because I think unless they come up with a new model of bringing it to India, we will not be able to afford the education fees or what the American colleges are going to charge. So I think that's going to be a challenge. But I think we should talk about creating an infrastructure, digital infrastructure to make it affordable. And Carpe Diem, I think it says, seize the moment. Yes, I agree with that. I think thank you so much for this group. I think the students are giving these words. And I think um, I heard that session. I would like to conclude before I invite the next speaker. But one of the key points from the student standpoint was assessment. And today, we have to recognize students in India aligned to the assessment. We need to completely transform assessment. For example, we have to seriously ask in postgraduate level and senior professional level, why can't we have open book exams? We are living in the era of Google. Why are we asking people to memorize? Second, bring in innovation in the, in the exam system. You can't repeat the same question, old question papers. I think this model has to change. So one of the thought process from that session when I heard them, uh, the lady who came in and spoke, Spandana was saying that assessment must be the start point of transformation in the quality of student experience. Now, thank you so much. Now I'm going to invite, uh, is Sangeeta there? Sangeeta, are you there? Yeah, I request yeah, only I'm here. Thank you, Sangeeta, for uh, finding time. It's always a pleasure to have you in any of our programs. And I request you to kindly share your thoughts because uh, Fiki at a national level is doing a huge amount of work in this, the national committee, and you have been personally driving some of them. Can you share some of your thoughts? Uh, here, we want to be a little bit selfish. We want you to wear the Telangana hat and try and help us to be the best in India. Thank you, Sangeeta. Over to you. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Let me uh, begin by saying that I think that you have all the specialists with you. And uh, I, I want to congratulate the format, the way all of you have structured this and you know what has been happening. I, um, I listened to a bit of uh, what was going on earlier. And I believe the approach is, is quite uh, outstanding, really. It's a perfect framework for moving into an execution strategy. So, um, you know, in uh, just an initial kind of thought, I think the current situation that we're in, uh, the, what's been happening over the last 261 days, I don't think can leave any of us unchanged or untouched. And so some of the fundamental questions which we asked the education fraternity before, but we re-ask them now in a more... Uh, you know, kind of powerful manner is how do we make students more resilient? How do we prepare them for jobs that haven't even been created? How do we equip them to thrive in an inter interconnected world and to appreciate different perspectives, different worldviews? How do we ensure multilateralism, inclusivity? How do we teach them to interact respectfully with each other and take responsibility for action towards sustainability, environment, collective well-being. So these are the questions I'm asking. I think, um, you know, earning your master's degree, uh, earning your undergraduate degree, and now most appropriately figuring out the skilling aspect uh, are, are things which are very well addressed in the policy. Uh, I, I think I'd also like to leave everyone with this thought that the future by definition is unpredictable. And by being attuned to some of the trends which are sweeping the world, we can learn and help students to learn, to adapt, to thrive, and to even take a role in shaping the future that they live in, not being passive recipients of what is happening. And that to me is one of the biggest opportunities to direct this, this bold, young, uh, energetic group of, of youth which is seeking the this appropriate direction. Um, I think your, your conference is focused on uh, the education policy and so I must uh, commend the government for the progressive policy, the aim to disrupt uh, the education system with transformative and generational reforms. Uh, I think the, the policy takes into as, you know, the, the FIKI team has described it for me as 
equitability, inclusivity, accessibility, and adds exploratory and experimental. And these, I think, really therefore say that this is Education 4.0. So let me commend all the policymakers and everyone who has played a role in this. Uh, I think it's important uh, for the FIKI team, not me personally, but FIKI to take some credit. Uh, NEP before, and, and Murli, you probably had a role in this, so let's commend you uh, that, you know, there have been wide stakeholder consultations since 2015. And Fiki played a role in all of them. I think even the last one, uh, Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan, uh, which was done four years ago, but all the other committees, Fiki has played a role in them. And over the last decade and a half, we have been uh, advocating things like graded autonomy, funding models, quality assurance, accountability, future skills, linked to pedagogy and pedagogy which understands and appreciates the real world. So upgradation of pedagogy, industry and academia linkage, research focus, internationalization, uh, faculty development, which I think has also been spoken about very appropriately. So I think Fiki has always touched on these points. And my understanding is that the current education policy and the vision 2030 has definitely noted these and made clear reforms and suggestions. So the current NEP and Telangana's policy is, is proactive. They're structured, um, uh, that tiered structure of type one, two, three is I think uh, very appropriate in terms of a strategy. Uh, the implementation and the execution of this is going to be key uh, to the entire go forward plan. And since you asked, you know, in terms of views, uh, I think that uh, I, I would like to add the fact that I believe that science and technology is going to be transformational, not just in science, but in every field. So if we take every single subject from, you know, whether you're making a plastic bag in a year from now or two years from now, that plastic bag is going to be illegal. So do we understand, have we incorporated plastic technology and transformed that into biodegradable? Uh, everything we're doing in medicine and science in the next five to 10 years is going to be completely transformed. So whether it's the handling of the pandemic, point of care testing, automation, artificial intelligence. So there's this deep need to incorporate uh, science uh, and technology into every area that we are doing. So is there an opportunity for Telangana to set up the National Science Foundation and make that like the core body with a serious interaction with, um, with industry? And academy and industry come together to disseminate um, digestible pieces of information. You all know from the time where we used to sit in a one-hour lecture, today's kids want everything in uh, uh, TikTok and Snack. Everything has to be bite-sized nuggets. I'm, I'm not talking about that level of superficial nature, but basically adoptable, absorbable science uh, from the perspective of usage for the industry and create the National Science Foundation, which has strong scientific core but a very effective, implementable interface with industry. Uh, so this, I think, would be, you know, my number one recommendation or additionality to the current thing uh, in case it's not fully, you know, adopted. Uh, I also want to go on to commend the fact that the policy is futuristic, both for the school and the higher education, and has attempted to comprehensively integrate vocational education from class six itself. This is a significant positive. Because for years we have been creating, um, you know, plus two students who want a desk job, who are unemployable, and even worse, you know, engineers and graduates who are unemployable. And I think there's nothing sadder for a parent who saved money, who's aspired for their children's education, who's made many personal sacrifices, and then to see that their child does not get a job and is also not qualified. Uh, mentally or skill-wise to do the job that the parent grew up in. So I, I think the, the transformation and the modification of uh, this to integrate vocational education 
uh, from the early stage is is a significant landmark and i i wish the government all the very best in implementing this in a truly systematic manner and putting an overlay of modularity so that after a 3 year or a 5 year of a vocational uh, role uh, there is a path available to move up the uh, the education track and therefore significantly introduce the concept of lifelong learning uh i i believe that um, this is you know the the next very you know significant point i also want to one minute, uh, one, minute. one minute yeah one minute left thank you okay so appreciate you know the fact that and many speakers would have said that are saying it but digitalization technology etc but translation of that into achieving this ger in education i believe currently uh, the state is at 26% and the aspiration to be 50 is really important uh, i will then just just move on to the last point uh, which is the growing demand for investment in education because uh, our aspirations to become the harvard our need to say that in telangana we want two or three of these globally recognized universities we're proud of isp we believe that we need more of these so for that i think the undp estimate for the total financial requirement for india to reach our sdg go for the goals by 2030 is estimated at 2000 billion us dollars uh, which averages to about 200 billion dollars per year this exceeds even the entire government budget which is only 76 billion so there's a great need to channelize further private investment but to do it in a manner which is credible which is not overly opportunistic uh, yet gives you know the value add and there's a, a beautiful coordination between the public and private which is not limited to just examination so here i would i would say the other point which is important and telangana has seen the disinvestment of some of our school uh, you know majors and we need to analyze why they disinvested it was not just an opportunistic disinvestment but the fact is that the current policy does not allow to invest surplus appropriately so i think it's time to allow institutions in india to invest their surplus their endowment funds in a wider asset class such as equity and alternate investments investment trusts and also to permit the adoption of a prop co op co model while enhancing our ability to monitor quality and also to syndicate uh, knowledge and content from the e learning uh, in a far more democratic manner Okay. Uh, with this i will conclude by saying once again mudlip and everyone else who has participated great job there is no greater power or no greater commitment than that to education i think the prime minister has emphasized putting together the implementation framework to translate uh, this policy into reality on the ground and with the federal system and education being on the concurrent list states will play a major role in this transformation and hence this blueprint for transformation uh, which is being created i commend telangana on this policy and uh, end with one last very quick uh, story when mr vagul who is you know one of the most iconic uh, bankers he inaugurated many years ago uh, at apollo the country's first masters in hospital administration this must have been 25 years ago and at that inauguration he said one thing which has stayed with me forever and he said all of you in industry or everybody not just industry uh, is worshiping goddess lakshmi and seeking wealth so goddess lakshmi is a deep well in the back of your house but goddess saraswati is a pond or a lake that the entire community can drink from so let us create these beautiful lakes of knowledge that the whole community continues to benefit from and on behalf of fiki i think we commit to the government that we will continue to be partners uh, in any aspect that they are looking for uh, in terms of ideation or implementation all the very best to all educationalists in this country namaste thank you sangeeta that was wonderful and uh, i think one point i want to take away for the government officers here the same spirit we demonstrated to being irda 
to Hyderabad several years ago. I was at that time aware of that. We should bring the same spirit to get NSF here. And I think NSF and educational district are two concepts which Telangana can adopt together because like financial district brought in some of them. We have to build a concept of educational district in Telangana. So I take that message. I like that message of private investment being very, very important and very salutary for the growth of the industry. Thank you, Sangeeta. And I'm now inviting Professor Raman Rao, who done a lot of research on what Telangana can do. He's going to present briefly for 10 minutes his uh, ideas on what can we do. He's the director of the Institute of uh, Warang NIT Warangal, one of the premier institutes in the country. Uh, Professor Raman Rao, over to you. Yeah, is my screen visible? Not yet. Not yet? Yes, it is visible. Sir, you got exactly 10 minutes, so your clock yeah. will show. I'm yeah. an academic, so I know the value of time. No, 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 I understand. Sorry, I'm just Thank doing it as a job. Yeah, so, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll try to keep the time. So, Basically, you know, the, if you see the national education policy, the main aim is to create a good, thoughtful, well-rounded, creative individuals. And uh, current type of education is not giving a intellectual curiosity, scientific temper, creativity, or the spirit of service among the students. So, so what are major problems of higher education in Telangana? I just come to my conclusion with the background. Right now, we have a rigid separation of disciplines with early specialization and streaming of students into narrow areas of study, which is a disadvantage when they actually go into the practice, in fact. And then limited access, particularly in socio-economically disadvantaged areas, with few or no higher education that teach in local languages. And the most important thing is a limited teacher and institutional autonomy. You know, that is not giving the teacher much freedom to experiment or to be flexible. In fact, we have inadequate mechanisms for merit-based career management and progression of faculty and institutional leaders. In fact, some of the points are already repeated. And uh, my experience, uh, I was also came, came from the state government here. There's a lesser emphasis on research at most of the universities and colleges, and lack of uh, competitive peer-reviewed research funding across disciplines. And then uh, uh, large, uh, the mo one of the most probably large affiliating universities resulting in low standards of undergraduate education. So most of the time, the universities are spending only on the affiliation issues, so which is what is actually. So for Telangana, what should be the roadmap? Uh, as suggested in the NEP itself, we had moved towards a higher education system consisting of large multidisciplinary universities and colleges with at least one in or near every district, as somebody rightly pointed out, an educational hub or a cluster with more higher education institutions across India that offer medium of instructions. And then moving towards a more multi undergraduate education, which is not there at present, and moving towards faculty and institutional autonomy, and uh, most impor importantly, revamping the curriculum the pedagogy, the assessment, and student support for enhanced student experience. Right now, we are just doing the road learning type of thing and evaluation. We are really not uh, producing students who are really employable to the industry. Uh, Reaffirm the integrity of faculty and institutional leadership uh, position through merit appointments and career progression based on teaching, research, and service. But this is very, very important. And then uh, we should, like National Science Foundation, uh, Telangana should also uh, uh, Establish a state research foundation to fund peer review research to actually see research in universities and colleges, which is very, very important. Because the majority of the problem is lack of funding. So the government should intervene, maybe with the help of industry. And the governance of higher education by highly qualified independent boards having academic and administrative autonomy, like FIKI and all that, the representatives can be there to actually. The regulations are there, but we have too many regulations. We should have light but tight as stipulated there. And now, with the help of this uh, so-called uh, increased access, equity, and inclusion through a range of measures can be done, including greater opportunities for outstanding public scholarships by private and philanthropic universities for disadvantaged and underprivileged students. We have many students who come from rural background who are not well educated, who do not have much opportunity, especially right now we are facing many students saying, we don't have a laptop, we are connecting all ourselves. But yes, we have to resolve that, we have to bandwidth is an issue, in some places electricity is an issue. So we have to increase the infrastructure. And of course, this pandemic has shown that online education and open distance learning, uh, we have to make available and uh, also take care of learners with disabilities. Uh, most importantly, the higher education institution should have the flexibility to offer different designs of master programs. So there could be a two-year master program with the second year due to entitled to research for those who completed three years bachelor program. Or so there are several models. And you know, depending on the industry's requirement, you could have integrated programs 
or other things. Similarly, uh, we have to ensure equitable use of technology. And this pandemic has really showed that uh, teachers have to move online. So online education needs a lot of training and a uh, lot of effort and a lot of infrastructure. And that is where the industry can actually uh, participate. Teachers acquire suitable training. Uh, we cannot assume that a good teacher in a traditional classroom will automatically become a good teacher in an online classroom. So I would uh, uh, put my recommendations of uh, as academician, sorry, uh, on uh, first is you have to restructure all the existing programs with multiple exit options. This is one of the key part of NEP, which is not there right now in Telangana. So students can move in and out depending on their uh, availability interest and all that. And many times there are cases where students go back to industry, uh, they are, what they learn in the uh, institute, then don't apply. Never, they don't get opportunity to apply. So when they go back actually in the domain and they are working, they let them come back to learn those skills which are really required for them. And then a lot of skill development process should be developed to enhance the skill set of workers in small and medium industries, unemployed youth and interested students. We find many people who are doing wonderfully without the education, maybe we should, uh, luckily we have now MOOC, SOIM and all that, all these online courses, which is making a lot of difference to the way uh, the people are getting skilled. And then the engineering branch, uh, other than his own branch of engineering, they should have also opportunity to go for allied science and social and humanities courses, depending on the interest. And uh, we also need to start, uh, like somebody was mentioning in the recommendation, artificial intelligence, which is now the key domain and which has taken almost every part of the industry. So potential and industry relevant bachelor programs should be introduced. These are the quick action points that I have done here at uh, NIT Varangal and I find a lot of response. And especially we have to encourage undergraduate students you know, because they come with a very tough competition background like JE to take up socially relevant research based projects. If we do this, definitely I think Telangana is already a very highly advanced uh, in terms of education, in terms of the quality of education that is offering. With these small changes, definitely it is going to make a lot of difference to the whole process. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity. I'm sorry I have taken more time. But, uh, no, no, no. I, I, you have been bang on, uh, Professor Raman yeah. Rao. I have only one question for you to think about. Actually, two questions. We have two minutes for you. One yeah. question is about what should faculty do? I think if you ask any student today, their biggest disappointment is many of the faculty cannot teach, they cannot research, they are rehashing whatever they knew. NIT may be an exception to some extent, but the question is, what should faculty do? We are telling about what others should do, what the government should do. What should faculty do? That's one point I wanted to talk about. In fact, uh, we should, uh, then if you see the NEP 2020, it shows, it tells very clearly that the faculty who are selected should be of certain quality, with certain threshold level of knowledge and all that. In fact, a lot of emphasis has been placed on the recruitment of good quality teachers. Luckily, this online education has given an opportunity for us wherein uh, a good teacher can teach uh, hundreds and thousands of classes at the same time because he's only using an online medium. Like this uh, uh, seminar, even if uh, five, ten people are there, there are several who can access the knowledge. And not only that, today the situation is we have research institutions who have got very good courses taught by very good experts like NPTEL, with IITs have taught, and these are available freely, free of cost. Only thing is the student who has interest can definitely access that and learn many of these courses. So the role of teaching is also changing, Professor. Uh, Professor yeah. Mulai, I want to suggest, uh, Professor Raman Rao, yeah. students, medium, the role of teacher is changing. Teachers are now becoming more of a facilitator rather than, you know, just a teacher in the traditional class. Yeah, please. Sir. No, you're bang on. I think that's a concluding statement I wanted to make. Teachers have to become learners themselves. That's yeah. our current yeah. Teachers are yeah. lifelong learning, you know. And uh, that, I see the point. I appreciate that for a very lot of candidness. Now, I'm going to the next session. We are going to be focusing on uh, uh, Naveen Mittal. Naveen, uh, you are known for uh, very candid views. Uh, I think you heard a lot from various uh, presentations. Uh, I would like to hear from you, what are your views on four or five things? Because there are too many things we cannot attempt. We can only attempt a few things. There are limitation of money, limitation of what uh, the kind of legislative uh, limitation. So I request you to focus on a few important things which the Telangana government can do. Whether they will do or not is another story, but at least we want to hear your views as a person who's gone to IIT, who's really applied his mind. I, I hope that we are not, I'm not expecting you to speak for the government alone. 
I also want to speak for yourself and Navin Mitra. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Mudli, and uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first of all, I must congratulate uh, Fiki for organizing this very important uh, webinar. In fact, uh, uh, I would say that we are going through very transformative times, and uh, good thing is that uh, uh, things are now falling in place in the sense the national education policy has come in. Uh, we are seeing maturing of technology, and uh, though we are facing this COVID pandemic, but it has really accelerated the adoption of uh, technology in education. So we are now able to talk of a bunch of uh, things uh, together. So uh, if you, I mean, I've been uh, uh, seeing the presentations which have been made by uh, different groups, and I must say that they've done uh, brilliantly well in terms of identifying the key points. Uh, if you ask me, I mean, there are, uh, I would say, let's say, let me talk about five things which uh, Telangana should do. Number one is uh, encourage uh, more private investment in uh, universities. So uh, we were, we are one of the uh, last states to bring in the Private University Act, uh, which came in uh, about one and a half year back. But uh, this year we are starting about five universities uh, in the state of Telangana. And I can tell you that two of them are really of uh, great national class and uh, possibly international level also. I mean, one of them is the Mahindra and the other is the Voxan. At least these two uh, universities, I can say that we can it will be something which uh, will make uh, state of Telangana proud in uh, coming times. And there are three others, but they mostly cater to the to the to the local needs of the state. So uh, we need to really encourage uh, more and more people to set up and go down this path. There are a few bunch of proposals which are which are already in mature stage, and I think we need to process them and then take them forward so that uh, more people are encouraged to invest in the state of Telangana because. Uh, I fundamentally feel that uh, uh, Hyderabad has a has a great great potential in the in the sector of education. We have been constrained in the past because of our uh, basic uh, internal constraints because of the Article 371D, which we had because of which we were not allow, able to allow students from outside to come and study in uh, Hyderabad. But I think uh, with the Private Universities Act, we are able to break that barrier and uh, move forward. So that is one. Two is uh, uh, taking forward the recommendation of uh, uh, the, the new national education policy. The sooner we get out of this uh, affiliated system, the better it is. Of course, it is linked to the national policy, and I've been mentioning it in some of my talks, uh, including the last talk with Fiki. Uh, the problem right now is that uh, the there is a reverse incentive uh, for the colleges. So whether you go to the best college, uh, or the worst college. Both these colleges are giving the same uh, degree. I mean, the, the the best engineering college in the state, which is affiliated to JNTU, or the worst engineering college, which is affiliated to the JNTU. Uh, both the students uh, get the same degree. So where is the differentiation? So kind of, I would say, uh, uh, junk is also surviving uh, because they are riding on uh, top of these uh, public universities. And the sooner they are made to uh, survive on their own, Quality will be will be the differentiator, and then the best would survive, and the worst would kind of no uh, get obliterated uh, with the market pressures. And I think uh, that is something uh, as a state and as a country we need to really accelerate, go into that direction, because if you look at globally, this affiliated system is only a system which is prevalent in South Asia, and uh, you don't see it in other parts of the world. Third is uh, uh, we need to strongly fund our uh, public universities especially from the research point of view. Uh, there has been some traction in the past because of the RUSA project, which has happened. Uh, in fact, Osmania University is um, uh, one of the ref beneficiaries of a RUSA funding of 100 crores, which is 60, 40 center state uh, funding. And we have, since I'm very strongly uh, involved with that process, I seen there is a huge uh, spurt in the research activity, which is happening in uh, Osmania. We are now talking to some international universities in joint researches and uh, cutting edge research. So uh, just a small funding of about 100 crores for a uh, for university like uh, Osmania triggers so much of uh, internal uh, uh, change. Uh, I'm sure that if this is sustained, there could be a real transformative effect. And uh, I also see, I mean, because I interact with a lot of international universities also, they also are very much interested in doing joint research because the cost of doing research in India is a fraction of uh, the cost which uh, one has to incur uh, in the universities abroad. So uh, it is a win-win. It is win because for every dollar which is spent by an international university, 
you get much much more uh, in terms of output and then uh, doing it together uh, is is definitely a win win so that is something we need to publicly fund research and we need to uh, jointly do more and more research is uh, i would say the third thing fourth uh, as one of the speakers have also said in the past we need to bring in um, more flexibility into our systems in the sense we have been constrained by this rigid rigid uh, systems rigid combinations uh, rigid uh, branches and i think uh, uh, the new national education policy and some of the changes which have been brought in by both ugc and dict uh, make us now uh, going for more flexibility for example now from from this particular year uh, a concept of minors and specialization has been brought in, into the engineering curriculum so you, so uh, so let's say a uh, student who is doing a btech in uh, computer science and engineering can actually do a minor in uh, 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 electronics or a, a, a specialization in artificial intelligence so you can do either a more horizontal program or a more vertical program and from this year we have also brought in some bit of flexibility in our uh, general degree courses also in fact uh, uh, we have brought in some sort of a bucket system and uh, uh, where students now can uh, opt across the domains for example uh, one of the examples i'll give you is that today it is now possible to do a bsc in maths economics and uh, uh, statistics in the state which was hitherto not possible because economics was the domain of the arts and maths and statistics were in the sciences so we've kind of brought in cross disciplinary uh, options in the subjects but i i would say that this is not the uh, kind of end it is just the beginning because uh, we are now able to think in terms of overall courses but we need to go into more more granular level uh, and ensure that students are able to opt even cross functional courses irrespective of the the subject which they are doing you know sort of a kind of a menu driven approach uh, to align what they what they what they want to learn with their own careers and how they see see their uh, future ahead uh, in 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 terms of uh, their journey ahead so flexibility i would say is the is the fourth item which i would like to emphasize and fifth uh, as has been brilliantly brought about by the group which uh, was looking at the blended learning uh, blended learning is something i would say is a, is a panacea for uh, our country uh, which which gets rid of uh, a lot of lot of basic level problems which we find you know you you spoke about the problem of faculty so uh, not just in terms of uh, building our faculty because you know through the through the uh, online approach through the blended learning approach we can actually train faculty remotely uh, i can tell you yesterday i was having a video conference with the nitter which is the national institute of uh, technical teachers uh, uh, training and research nitter which is based in chennai they have really like surge ahead in last 6 months in training technical teachers uh, through the online methods so much so that they are training now nit teachers and uh, uh, triple it teachers also and uh, we are we are we are working with them for organizing programs for our uh, technical teachers so idea is that now things can be be done much more cheaply uh, faculty sitting back in their own institutions and then kind of trained on some of the best best practices we are also organizing some programs internationally also during uh, this pandemic uh, lockdown and parallelly uh, students now also uh, have the opportunity not just to restrict to the courses within their own institutions but also uh, do courses from some of the best universities which they really didn't have access to i mean uh, on swam or on nptel you can actually do a course from an iit Uh, which otherwise was was impossible for a student to access so i think these are the bunch of things which uh, put together give me lot of hope and i am some of very very optimistic uh, about the future in fact uh, uh, one of the writers uh, wrote in one of the articles which i read that uh, new education policy new national education policy is kind of a 91 moment for education uh, uh, what 91 was for industry and i think to a great extent that is right and uh, i see uh, a uh, a uh, huge possibility of change and uh, uh, can can be a real real big beneficiary of this transformation thank you navin i think as usual you always very candid very clear explicit and i have a few points for you to consider yeah. the first point i think this is based on whatever we heard so far and uh, the first point is about teachers learning what is the science of learning most of our teachers know subject knowledge they have no idea what is the concept of learning itself is it just a science there's a psychology behind it 
there is a lot of uh, uh, interventions where when you talk of blended learning we talk about action learning we talk about social learning there are several models of blending it's not just online offline so my first recommendation for navin when you think about government should introduce a large scale program of teaching our teachers what is learning science how some learners learn some way some learners learn differently what is audio learning they don't know that so one area recommendation which has come and i want to focus on that as a very important area mm, good point only yep yeah yeah second is national sounds foundation i think sangeeta reddy spoke about it we will be very grateful if the bureaucracy and fiki all of us can put our weight on it we would like to make sure nsf comes here if nsf comes here around that will come a huge number of institution uh, like what irda did to insurance we will like to try and bring in more and more research institutions around it uh, and into this system so i would request the government also to look at nsf as an option the third one especially for you is on assessment i think today if you ask any student and i can tell you because i am a student in law college now in urismani university your assessment is outstandingly outdated we are asking for people to write essays we are asking them to do objective answers both of them are outdated today we talk about innovation in assessment is something we have to bring each teacher each university should be thinking about how do we apply knowledge for example open book exams i talked about it earlier the more faster you bring some of them teachers have to change they will have to learn that they can't just repeat something in the same uh, subject every year year after year and students are going to look at google and therefore they are going to learn faster than them so my third submission is i would request you to look at clearly the assessment how can you transform assessment so you will be happy to know murli that uh, in polytechnics we are introducing open book exams from the incoming okay. semester in fact uh, to tell you very frankly 25 years back when i went to iit we we used to have open book exams and i've been asking this question to our faculty members why can't why don't we have open book because that is how uh, they are going to be uh, utilizing their knowledge so you're right and 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 both assessments i just want to because since you raised this issue uh, something which is brilliantly brought out by the national education policy which says assessment of learning assessment for learning and assessment as learning so assessment of learning is from the for the side of the teacher to to okay. really understand how, what is what is uh, learned assessment for learning is basically for the side of the two student to really know how much he or she has learned and assessment as learning is also it is a process of learning so i think uh, uh, this is something which we are very conscious about and we'll be taking it forward thank you navin uh, i'm going to invite before the last comment for you and i said that earlier our teachers have to change their name from teachers to learners they must learn lifelong then they can teach their children better they can True. teach new new methodology so i think the terminology itself we have to consider are they facilitators i think ramon rao talked about facilitation so we must talk about some other way of bringing that out into some other form so i request you to consider that okay. yeah thank you so much and now i invite uh, navin thank you so much i invite jayesh jayesh is always been the most important go to person from the industry so my request to you is to specifically talk about the in, uh, education as an industry and can telangana take the lead like you have taken for every single part uh, healthcare various industries how do you make education is the most profitable most successful the leading industry in telangana somebody talks about earlier new south wales or some of the country the second largest earning is from foreign students who coming in to learn so how do we make this as uh, a exciting place for investment to take place how what kind of industrial policy and i again want you to speak on two hats one as jayesh ranjan as an individual because you're going to go to the best of the institution and also as a representative of the government over to you jayesh thank you thank you thank you mr murli taran uh, <clears throat> first of all i would like to compliment uh, other panel speakers the plenary speakers and also all the members of the working groups they have given some very very useful and practical suggestions in fact they have laid out the road map which a state like telangana should imbibe in a very uh, comprehensive manner so congratulations to them so uh, mr murlidhan i I'll, i'll do i'll i'll do speak about uh, uh, the way in industry in education can be structured as an industry but what i'll do is uh, i'll also mention one kbi right away 
that uh, industry will be attracted only if there is a good uh, demand for it so unless you create enabling conditions unless you create a good demand for it industry will not respond and uh, let me then now explain what it takes to create that demand and uh, let me actually go back uh, uh, in time five and a half years ago i had joined as the in, uh, it secretary in the state and as all of us know it is a big contributor to the economy to employment and uh, i'm sure all of you would know this that the state of telangana was uh, created on certain very fundamental uh, aspects one of it was uh, jobs there was a sense that uh, in the combined state uh, the students or the eligible candidates from telangana were not getting their deal so there was always that sense of uh, relative deprivation that all the jobs are getting knocked away by people from the other uh, part of the state and therefore we, we must have our own state and we must become masters of our destiny so when i became the it secretary i did some kind of a very quick survey with the help of my staff on what is the actual uh, employment position in the it industry and i found out of course this is a very rough survey so that is why i don't uh, speak about this data in public because it is not 100% authentic but roughly it tells you about the realities of the it sector so what we found out was that 60% of the people who are working in the it sector are from outside uh, andhra pradesh or telangana or hyderabad they are from other uh, states and 40% are telugu speaking so one may feel good that okay 40% are telugu speaking but then if you do a deeper dive on who this 40% are you will find that of course a majority of them are again from uh, districts of andhra pradesh they are not from districts of telangana and uh, of course some of them are from uh, hyderabad which is a more of a cosmopolitan district but even then if you find out who these hyderabadi students are you will find that they are their parents or their origins are again in uh, andhra pradesh so uh, my assessment of of that survey was that there would be hardly 10% students or 10% employees rather in the it sector who can be genuinely called uh, students belonging to telangana districts so that uh, kind of uh, let us thinking advise it that uh, this such a big industry more than 1000 uh, 1400 companies and only 10% uh, are genuinely telangana students and then we also asked uh, some of these big recruiters i remember again this was this is an old story almost 5 5 and a half years ago i remember calling the hrs of wipro tcs infosys some of the big recruiters from uh, hyderabad colleges or telangana colleges and they told something which uh, hit me very very hard they told me that uh, we find uh, frankly speaking the students of uh, telangana colleges of course barring the iit of course when we say telangana colleges we must remember that i am not talking about iit hyderabad or triple it hyderabad or some of the best uh, jntu and osmania colleges i mean they are a league apart so uh, i i am when i am saying telangana colleges don't see it as a very sweeping generalization i mean the average uh, typical college which is in the outskirts or periphery of hyderabad or which is in some district so the feedback about these kind of colleges was that uh, though we recruit some students because in many of the it es companies we just require numbers to fill up the seat so we uh, we recruit some number of students but frankly we find them that they do not have any knowledge about anything nor do they have these soft skills and we spend uh, months all together in uh, retraining them and for an it company particularly an it es company spending a month all together paying salary to an employee and not getting even 1 rupee in return it's a very big ask for them it's a very big burden and uh, something else also with they told was that after this training gets over we notice many of the students actually jumping ship they complete our infosys training for 6 months or wipro training for 8 months and thereafter they kind of jump ship so of course as a very immediate and a very emergency kind of response we started this institution called task telangana academy of skills and knowledge which started working with these colleges to find out what are the skill sets which companies look for what is it that you miss in your syllabus how do i add that but the malaise lies uh, deeper if you really look at why is it that colleges in telangana a large number of them produce uh, students whom the industry finds of no good at all of no worth or no merit at all so if you look at what exactly ails uh, these colleges there are certain fundamental 
deficiencies and certain uh, flaws and my personal feeling is that while nep is very broad based gives multiple kind of solutions multiple kind of recommendations those recommendations which are going to address our specific flaws and gaps and deficiencies should be adopted wholesale recently in one of the national conferences the prime minister mentioned that syllabus reforms will happen in 2022 but we need not wait for that if we know what are the problems which need to be fixed and which component of nep is going to fix those problems let us wholeheartedly adopt those and uh, i'm glad that my colleague uh, navin mittal who is in a senior leadership position in the higher education department he is there uh, and uh, i'm sure people from the higher education council and others we should uh, get into action now so i'll point to three particular things uh, and of course these are not uh, new points that i'm mentioning some of the groups spoke about it when you were talking to professor ramna rao mr murli dharan you asked him about it so it's these these three things are very well known but if you want me to prioritize what part of nep we must roll out immediately these three will be topmost in my opinion the first will be the teachers in fact uh, training of teachers so navin mentioned about this institution in chennai which is training mr Ram, professor ramna rao also agreed that uh, teachers training is very important in my opinion this is the fundamental if it if it can either make the system or break the system in fact uh, in my career as you as uh, would be known to all of you uh, we work in the districts for some period in our uh, career so i used to be the district collector and so on and so forth and there also as a district collector all of us want the government schools to do well government of schools government schools to do better and so on and so forth and i my experience of course this is an old experience but my experience is that amongst the various reasons why government school children were not really able to uh, move up the ladder i found that uh, one of the biggest uh, reasons which pulled them back was the teachers the teachers were so insipid they were just not able to motivate the students guide the students in colleges of higher education also we see the same thing that uh, very few students are self motivated self driven because the teachers are not able to create that sense of excitement enthusiasm that passion for learning because teachers themselves have not been trained or lack in various things i'm uh, for the last uh, one year plus i'm also the officiating vice chancellor of uh, the jntu and uh, in that capacity i do meet uh, teachers someone has some grievances someone wants to represent something and so on and so forth and i notice that uh, there may be phd's there may be uh, they may have got uh, high education qualifications but uh, when you interact with them when you ask them about something they appear to be very shallow i mean uh, 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 it it does not give uh, confidence uh, when one talks to them that they will be able to do a brilliant job when they are interacting with the students etc so running a very solid uh, teachers training program particularly the in service teachers i'm sure that the new teachers who will be recruited there will be uh, subsequent uh, quality checks etc etc but what to do with uh, hundreds and thousands of teachers who are already in the system and we must be very ruthless in, in my opinion they must uh, attend uh, in service courses we must get some institution design specific courses there must be there must be some kind of an accountability in terms of the kind of uh, research output the kind of students feedback they get we must be in a position to very significantly downgrade some teachers if they are not able to perform properly so every everything in the nep eventually is in the hands of the teachers while administrators have some role policy makers have some role lots of people spoke about funding so obviously teacher can't do anything about funding there are certain external uh, elements as well but presuming that all those things are sorted out then the delivery happens by the teachers and that is in my opinion the weakest link so telangana should prioritize on uh, running uh, very good in service programs and uh, uh, good programs for incoming teachers and ensure a very high level of quality and accountability the second thing which uh, i would like to point out again uh, this is based on the feedback of recruiters that students really don't know anything now this is a bit uh, paradoxical because the student has completed 4 years of engineering education he has a btech degree he can show the degree uh, that i got some gpa of 7 or gpa of 8 or gpa of 6 but it again uh, is a very meaningless kind of degree and a very meaningless kind of score because the whole focus is on that i pass some exam and i get some marks and uh, i come out of it 
and tomorrow when the employer wants me to do some uh, application development or some uh, tool development i have no understanding on how to do it because my entire four years was focused first of all i wasted uh, practically most of the time and closer to the exam i use some guide book or coaching book or took some shortcut kind of methods and appeared in some exam got some results and uh, today i can claim that i have an engineering degree when frankly speaking i don't know anything about the subject so my personal feeling is which again is a very important recommendation of nep is to come out of this exam focus assessment and again uh, we need not wait for prime minister to announce how to do this we can do it ourselves we know that uh, it has been tried out in cbse schools a uh, few years ago and it has worked out well so there are established model western universities do not have uh, any big emphasis on exams even some of the colleges which i have attended personally we did not have any great uh, who do about this exams and all there was a sense of continuous assessment and that is something which will bring engagement and quality in the teaching learning process if i am evaluated literally on a daily basis so this is again something which in telangana we must imbibe and the last point which i'll make uh, the, again based on what the industry experience has been the industry ex experience has been as i said that students don't uh, learn anything i mean students don't know anything but if you check the opinion of the industry about the same students after one year or two years the feedback changes dramatically someone who was pointed two years ago as someone who does not know anything two years later is found to be a very good performer he's contributing is he is earning uh, revenues for that company and if you ask the student himself or rather the employee or the candidate himself the candidate confesses that i learned more in the job than what i learned in the classrooms and even the most brilliant students candidly if you ask them they will admit it that after i got a job i learned much more than what uh, my professor taught me in the classroom etc etc so if that is the reality why not make that industry experience a part of the curriculum why delay it till the student passes out gets into a job and then he starts learning why not bring that learning early we have been discussing this this is a important regulation a recommendation in the uh, nep also again this is something which can be implemented immediately we need not again wait for someone else to tell some some guidelines from outside there are large number of uh, fiki members there are large number of nascom members CII members, if we are able to work out an arrangement that these colleges are tagged to you, you must uh, participate in the curriculum development. Your uh, faculty, uh, your uh, staff must come and take guest lectures. You must give uh, internship opportunities in a very rigorous way. I'm sure the whole nature of uh, education can be changed. So three priority areas, in my opinion, training of teachers, reducing that exam focus and have a uh, system of continuous evaluation. and uh, increased uh, industry participation right on year 1 in uh, conducting these courses if we are able to reform these three fundamental things without waiting for any one else to tell us to do so we will create a very strong uh, enabling environment and then uh, the initial question that you asked will the industry flow into this section i am 100% confident that they will do that and telangana should feel proud that even if we are a late starter will be welcoming the best uh, global universities to our shores thank you uh, jayesh as usual uh, very comprehensive very incisive uh, i like all the three points that you mentioned i think they are bang on today i am going to raise two or three points for you to think about uh, first and of course is the leadership i think there is a lot of comment on the nep about the way vice chancellors are appointed by the way you want leadership change in a system they even talked about i think last time jagdish shet also talked about how private universities abroad have a presidential model presidents are appointed etc etc he also of course talked about non profit focus of the university higher education through the money stays all the profit they make my question therefore is what kind of leadership change can we bring about right now i understand many of the ias officers are now vice chancellors of many of the universities we need to or pro vice chancellors we need to look at how do you bring leadership change how do we bring in quality leadership and the second point is how do you bring motivation of teachers teachers motivation is also very poor the compensation is some level i have enough statistic to show that some of the payment we made to our fac our faculty is very poor so can you please talk about these two leadership and teachers motivation what can we do see uh, 
Re regarding uh, leadership in a university, then obviously the vice chancellor uh, provides that leadership. And my assessment is, of, of course, I'm associated only with the JNTU, but uh, my predecessor vice chancellor, he did a very good job. His predecessor did a good job. So there's a fairly good system of uh, picking uh, the leaders, leader at the top. But then there is one more point. See, uh, these universities, at least in our state, they also have an executive council, EC which uh, is like the board of directors in a private sector company. And uh, it is that board or the EC, which also gives lots of uh, support to the vice chancellor, also takes uh, lots of policy decisions, gives uh, uh, also maintains an uh, oversight in uh, the university's functioning. So vice chancellor, of course, uh, handles all the administrative matters, but important policy directions, etc., which new courses to start. If you have to uh, take up a partnership with an overseas university, which university to partner with, and so on and so forth and important decisions so for example i'll give you a, uh, one example about jntu uh, i'm the vice chancellor as i said for the last one year we filed uh, that uh, artificial intelligence is, has become very very transformative so we were able to take a very good decision again with the support of the executive council that uh, regardless of what you are studying whatever course you are studying in jntu you must do a compulsory course on uh, artificial intelligence. So because the EC was there and EC agreed with this view and EC supported, we have been able to implement this decision and uh, roll it out. So by and large, my sense is that even if that one person has some uh, flaws, etc., as long as you have a good EC with uh, a good mix of uh, academicians, industry leaders. So I'm very fortunate that the JNTU EC is like that. We have lots of uh, private sector representatives. We have uh, the task CEO is one of the members. So he brings the students perspectives and senior academicians are there and so on and so forth. So uh, by and large, leadership is important. But the way things have been structured in Telangana are quite all right. I, I do not see any major uh, reason to change anything of uh, what is there. OK. All right. I think. Uh... Is Naveen there? Is, is Naveen Mittal is there? Is there left? I thought I'll ask a few questions for both of you. But coming back to last question uh, for you, Jayesh, um, on the private investment, I think I think Sangeeta talked about it. Even in primary schools now, in school education, some of the entrepreneurs from Telangana are exiting. They're getting a better deal. They're selling out. Now the question is, why are they doing it? Will the same thing happen in private universities also? People will exit. Our intention is the private universities should come in a large scale. We already have a large footprint, but we need to increase it further. And they should coexist with the public universities. So we need to build a methodology wherein private is not against the public and private is not public is not against the private. So what are your few thoughts on how do you build in collaboration between these two? This is the last question. And that will be very critical for private investors to come in. They see a threat for their existence because of price capping. You know what happened in price capping in engineering colleges or scholarship model, which brought in by the previous Congress government. Now, all of them impact the profitability of the business. So we need to give them a stable environment. And I would like you to share some thoughts on the policy level. What can we do? See, my uh, two, two, three points. So one is uh, that this particular uh, news, in fact, I'm carrying the copy of Times of India, which mentions that some of these education entrepreneurs are exi exiting, some uh, schools have closed down, etc. My personal sense is it is only the current uh, COVID scenario, which is a very helpless situation for everyone. Colleges and schools cannot uh, open, the admissions uh, cannot take place in a regular way. Fees payment cannot happen because the parents, uh, their wages, their salaries have also been affected. But the colleges have expenses which are fixed. You have to pay for salaries of your teacher. So it's a very helpless situation. And uh, I don't have any ready answer. So if some people are exiting because of the pressures of the current situation, I, I can fully understand and comprehend why is it happening. But it does not show any fundamental weakness in the private sector model. The private sector model has worked for so many years. I mean. While the universities have been permitted now, but private engineering colleges, private schools are here for uh, decades and uh, they have uh, complemented the government school system. In fact, if you recall some years of, uh, about a decade ago when the Right to Education Act was introduced, there was a mandatory requirement that every private school will take children from uh, the working class, the underprivileged class, 
which would have typically gone to a government school and some number of seats will be given to them and some uh, some uh, schools have done that and they have benefited from this kind of a social uh, intermingling there are certain schools in fact many people do not know this but i can share this with you one of the best uh, the, the school which is considered one of the best in the country it is called uh, doon school it is in dehradun doon school uh, when i was a student i remember uh, when i was in a, a school student since those days and even earlier they always used to give uh, scholarship seats to students from uh, you know ordinary families so doon school had some very elitist children but also had children from very modest means our hyderabad public school hps here while again there are some very elitist students who go there but many of us will not know this but there is a reserved uh, number of seats also which are meant for uh, under privileged children etc so the experience of private schools in uh, promoting social equity social justice also setting good uh, standards for government schools has been very good and uh, today while uh, we are speaking about telangana i should uh, point this out to you that our uh, residential schools while there are day schools which are typically seen as government schools but we have hundreds and thousands of uh, residential schools also which do phenomenally well given the kind of children whom they admit initially and uh, the kind of effort one needs to put to those children the kind of outcomes which come out of these residential schools are phenomenal in fact our residential schools are role models for the whole country for the whole world as a matter of fact so both there is a space for both uh, private system of education as well as uh, public system of education they should complement each other the langana experience has been by and large uh, quite positive in my opinion thank you so much i think i'm going to conclude now i think uh, it's been a wonderful day about 3 uh, 3 hours 3 and a half hours we've had in the first part we heard from uh, international universities what is their mantra what have there been the success stories then we deep dived into three parallel sessions when we asked very pointed questions what can we do right now for telangana so those recommendations came and we had two illuminating talk by two of uh, most important people in the bureaucracy related to education the industry secretary and also higher education secretary i am going with certain kind of feelings at this point of time at the end of this session i think one clear understanding i want to leave behind for all of us in the audience things cannot go back to normalcy we have to change on two context one blended learning which is going to be fueled by the covid and the new technology in the adoption of technology and to a large extent national education policy which is going to drive the change so we have a choice in the industry among the student community among the faculty either we want to change embrace the change go with the full hog into it or we resist it we try and find ways of trying to find ways of not doing it my submission from whatever i heard from this group and the whatever i heard from the ias officers telangana state is ripe we want to bring about change i want to leave that message for uh, especially for uh, jayesh and uh, navin that uh, we at fiki will be more than happy to sit one on one and go into specifics of what are the five or six things the state should do to be the first in Thelang in uh, india and we should be able to bring global and national students into telangana like jayesh talked about there is on one side public spending should be spent on local citizens there is also another side we need to have a cosmopolitan environment for bringing in the best of students there may be a difference in pricing policy like it happens in the us foreign students pay more than the local students but we need to bring in more cosmopolitan more and more of international and uh, national students into telangana and i strongly request the government to seriously think about treat education as an industry bring about methodologies so that investment pours into the state because i don't know how many of you are aware one of the largest employment created an opportunity happens in education uh, you look at a school or a college so the more the education industry flourishes we will bring in more employment into the state so uh, with these words i i want to thank every single panelist uh, and uh, especially ikfai business school and sudhakar for what tirelessly to bring all of you into this forum i want to thank the audience i think it's been an outstanding audience and i want to thank so many questions have come but i think because of time limitation what we will do i'll ask fiki to collect those questions and if possible route it back to the uh, speakers and if they have a reply we'll try and return it back to the people 
who have asked those questions. So once again, we are on time. Uh, on time, we want to thank you, and I'm going to sign off with a big, big thank you to all the people in the audience and the speakers. Thank you very much. Over to Sudhakar. Uh, thank you, sir. It's been, it's been a fantastic day. Uh, as a host, I really enjoyed the last 215 minutes, wherein we witnessed about 23 distinguished speakers uh, who had uh, spoken in five different panels and deliberated, applied their thought, and uh, and everything was working towards one single desire of making Telangana a global higher education hub. I want to very quickly and profusely thank uh, Professor Devashish Chatterjee, Director I am Koi Code for uh, delivering an insightful keynote address on leading for global excellence, making Telangana an education hub for the world. And very quickly, I think Dr. Ashwin Fernandez from QS chipped in and brought uh, uh, Professor Sabu and Mr. Caesar, one from University of Southampton and one from uh, other from uh, Qatar for sharing their case studies. It was fantastic. And we have drawn lessons from these world-class universities, how they have actually led their journey of becoming international, becoming rich, and transforming the lives of the students, which are part of their universities. Uh, we had breakout sessions, which are parallel, that kept the back-end team on their uh, toes. Uh, everything was synchronous, and that was the fun. So the blended learning was very, very interesting, and it was led in style by Dr. Shantanu Paul, uh, with uh, Supreet Nagaraju from Adobe, uh, Saurya from Coursera, and Kala Anand from Kriya University. I think many thanks to Dr. Shantanu Paul for very quickly distilling the thoughts and presenting the actionable recommendations. We also had uh, the benefit of uh, listening to Mr. Raman, Raman and Ramanathan, uh, the mission director of Atal Innovation Mission, the PIO Government of India, and also uh, Amrita from University of Edinburgh, and joined by Professor P. J. Narayanan from IIIT Hyderabad. This was very very interesting because of uh, the theme achieving sustainability in higher education space, led by Professor Atul Khosla, founder of Sulini University. They could not uh, present the slide, but uh, the output and the recommendations were shared very nicely and deftly. In spite of uh, difficulties on health front, I think uh, Professor Atul has uh, done a fantastic job. My thanks personally and professionally to him, and it was very, very inspiring to listen to all the speakers. In the another parallel session we had uh, on student outcomes led by Mr. Nathan, who is the partner and chief uh, talent officer of Deloitte. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Mahendra Reddy from ICFI and Professor Venkat Ramna from uh, Telangana State Council of Higher Education and Sangeeta Ponappa from uh, SLK Software in Bangalore and uh, Sai Spandana from US. Actually, this panel had fantastic uh, uh, coverage in terms of uh, people joining from India and abroad, say Bangalore, Mumbai, Hyderabad uh, and Pennsylvania and uh, talking uh, synchronously about uh, the student outcomes the teacher perspective, industry perspective, and the student perspective. That was fantastic uh, for us to, uh, it was very difficult for us to flip between the sessions. It was so interesting. And then I must thank uh, uh, Dr. Ashwin, uh, Dr. Shantanu, Paul, uh, Mr. Uh, Nathan, Professor Atul for their recommendations. They were, they were really sharp and actionable. And to them, I think uh, the response has been pretty good from the IAS officers, Mr. Navin Mithal and uh, and also Mr. J.S. Ranjan, very comprehensively given, without mincing any words. Uh, very, very nice. I think the Telangana experience uh, being shared by Dr. Envi Ramana Rao was also interesting because he has worked on this subject for quite some time. The benefit of uh, listening to Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, uh, the perspective from industry, from uh, uh, the Fiki uh, chairperson, is a fantastic addition and I'm very thankful to uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy. Uh, I want to also thank uh, uh, Mr. Murlidharan for uh, assimilating all the questions that were flowing in from various uh, participants, 2,000 plus participants, I'm told, from various channels who, who were glued to the screens today in the last uh, 215 minutes. I think those questions were nicely put to the concerned person and uh, responses were elicited. It was a fantastic qualitative session. Thank you, sir. I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Murli Krishna Edigaru, who proposed, who opened the session, welcoming the plenary. And uh, behind the scenes, there has been a constant support from these two gentlemen, and also Mr. Uh, Ajit Rangneka, the former uh, dean of ISB, uh, who who was not part of the session today, but uh, he is also 
very much behind drawing the session outlines and helped me quite a bit. I would also, on behalf of uh, Fiki, would like to thank the partners, uh, ICFI, Coursera, Roots Degree College, Metamorphosis, uh, the media partners like Business World and Business World Education, Telangana Today, APAC Digital News Network, and of course, we are supported by Sudhakar uh, Pipes and Fittings and Mac Projects. The event was hosted on a fantastic new age tech platform called uh, uh, Almond Vertex. It has gone through without any single hassle. I'm extremely thankful to them. They came in as a partners and uh, helped us conduct this wonderful show. I'm, I'm quite thankful to all the members who have attended. And uh, last but not the least, the team that was relentlessly working uh, from ICFI, the 12 members who worked in the last 15 days, I would like to thank them uh, personally. And also the team led by Akhilesh with Fiki Telangana and also Fiki Delhi. I think all of them were constantly running and tried to put everything together so meaningfully. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Sudhakar. We sign off. Thank you so much. Yeah.